So uh, we've had kind of a day of very high level talks about what goes on maybe above blockchains within smart contracts. Um, and I'm go going to actually dive to lower layers and to remind us that the security of Bitcoin and other uh, cryptocurrencies, other blockchains, relies very heavily on the network infrastructure. So Eli uh, did a good job of presenting me. I do have kind of my two hats. One of them is uh, an academic in the Hebrew University, and I work on scalability of Bitcoin security and economic incentives. And I think each one of the talks that I'll be giving throughout the summer school covers exactly uh, one of these things. Um, and in my other hat, uh, as Eli mentioned, I, I'm a co-founder at Kedit, uh, where we do zero knowledge proofs and privacy in blockchains. Uh, you'll be hearing a lot of this on this topic on Tuesday from, uh, from amazing speakers, from Zuko, from Eli, Niha, and Rafael Paz. Um, uh, so these are all things that I, I love and uh, do a lot. So um, I think this is maybe the obligatory slide when you talk about blockchains. You have to talk about the double spend attack, right? So this is uh, the thing that Bitcoin was basically designed to prevent most, most than, more, more than anything else. Uh, maybe uh, a transaction that you have in the blockchain somewhere uh, that someone uh, accepted as, as good payment and suddenly somebody shows up with a longer chain of blocks and uh, Bitcoin nodes are built to basically say the longer chain of blocks is the one that holds uh, and so your transaction is gone, right? So maybe the most basic result uh, that Satoshi Nakamoto provided us is kind of a theorem. Into, I, I'm not sure it was even uh, phrased as a theorem in, in his original paper, but the result still holds uh, to some degree, right? At least uh, qualitatively. If the attacker controls less than half of the computer, uh, compute power, right, right, half of the hash power, and as long as nodes can send blocks quickly, then we know that we can be safe uh, against these attacks against our transactions in the sense that the probability of having our block replaced decreases exponentially fast. Right? So the probability that we, we're going to lose this money decreases as, it's, uh, as we find it buried deeper and deeper in the, in the blockchain. And this is maybe the most basic theorem about the security of Bitcoin. Um, and actually, every time you want to try and attack Bitcoin security, it goes through one of the assumptions for this theorem. Right? So these are the two assumptions. Uh, there are actually more assumptions that, that are uh, implicit that I did not specify. Right? Maybe the cryptographic primitives have, have to be sound and secure. But uh, definitely, I like the fact that nodes can communicate quickly and send block messages to each other very fast and that the attacker controls less than half of the compute power as two, ma two main uh, assumptions there. Um, and we really don't know what to do with this one, that the attacker has less than 50% of the compute power because we don't know the attacker. We, we're not, you know, right, he might be attacking and we don't know who that is. So what we really like to think of is how to make the network really, really large um, so that attackers will find it very hard to get 50% of all compute resources. So, in, and that's really done through incentives, right? So maybe there's an assumption here that underlies this one, that nodes have incentives to participate and that these cause the network to be very large and, and hence very secure. Um, so now, if we want to attack these, uh, this theorem, maybe we can start thinking about what happens, right? Everything somehow touches upon these assumptions. If we have very large blocks, we want to start to scale Bitcoin to have more transactions per second. They take longer to propagate and that violates this assumption of communicating quickly. Um, we might do attacks on the network infrastructure, right? So nodes aren't able to talk to each other at all. Uh, maybe they're not able to coordinate on the blockchain. Um, and we have things like uh, maybe uh, selfish mining or other incentive issues. Maybe we can show that the incentives are not as aligned as we think, and we can try and hit the protocol in that way. Right? So these are very common ways of of disrupting, in some sense, the system. Um, and uh, actually, each one of the talks is going to be exactly about one of these uh, issues. So today, I'm going to start with network attacks. And there, I'm going to talk about two main types of attacks. One is uh, via Bitcoin's network formation. Uh, so this will be the, something known as the eclipse attack. 
So we're going to talk about how the Bitcoin protocol forms its peer-to-peer -peer network. The second part is going to focus more on the network infrastructure, right? Bitcoin lives over the internet, other cryptocurrencies as well. Um, and here I'm going to talk about two main things. One is attacks when on, on the routing infrastructure, and the other one is man-in-the-middle attacks. So everything I'm going to, to say in this session, I think, won't come as a very big surprise to anybody who knows how the internet works and has seen these sort of network attacks before. But it's just, I think, worthwhile to discuss the security of Bitcoin, uh, not just from the context of how much hash rate the attacker has. If we wanted to attack the protocol, this is another means of doing so. And it might be cheaper to do this than to acquire half of the computational power in the world, right? especially for Bitcoin or Ethereum. Um, so let's get started. So what I want to start with is maybe just the, what is the general consequence of, of having the network split, right? So let's say we somehow manage to break up communications in the network in a way that uh, nodes on one side cannot communicate with nodes on the other. So in this case, what immediately happens to the blockchain is that we immediately get a split in the blockchain itself, right? Uh, so the node that built this block could not have transmitted it to nodes on the other side, and so they've built, each one has built their own version of, of this chain. So this is quite obvious, uh, and this can of course be used for double spending attacks. If the attacker can still touch both sides of, of, of the network, he can transmit conflicting transactions, and once the network reconnects, only one of these chains will survive, the other one gets destroyed. Right, so if, you, if you've managed to disrupt the network for maybe, I don't know, 30 minutes, there's a 30 minute backlog of transactions that's going to probably, you know, maybe disappear. At least half of them are going to go away. Um, and of course, the attacker, having split the power of the network, can maybe even create a ch chains of his own, right? You don't have to pit the two sides of the network against one another. Uh, they've actually been building uh, chains that are shorter than they would have had they been communicating with each other. So it, it takes less computational power to, to do your own uh, longer chain, right? But you can also, of course, b uh, add your power to one of the sides. You can do all sorts of things that you'd want, right? So, so basically, a miner, uh, somebody who disrupts the blockchain might not even have any hash, hash power of his own, and you can orchestrate double spending attacks very easily. Um, so maybe one more thing to, to notice is that uh, the splits also give us other nasty things. For example, the block creation rate on each side of the network is slowed down considerably. Uh, you don't have as much hash rate working on each one of the, of the chains. You, you're basically uh, in, uh, accepting transactions very slowly. Um, you're maybe not able to transmit transactions. Think about an exchange that's supposed to be sending people money, and they're not able to even communicate with the rest of the Bitcoin network if somehow the network is split off. Uh, and of course, there's, there are these consequences of reorganizations after the split that we've talked about. Okay, so other, other attacks like selfish mining that we'll hear about tomorrow from, from Itai can also be uh, boosted with, with this technique. So, um, We've, we've had an incident of, of kind of a suspension of, of financial payment systems in, in Israel. Uh, I think this was in 2014. There was some bug in the software that people couldn't pay uh, for, with credit cards anywhere in Israel. So the stories uh, in the press were, were, were quite bad. Uh, people were leaving um, you know, shopping carts full of groceries in the supermarket because the credit card that they were going to use to pay for it didn't work at, the, at that time. And so they, they didn't have enough cash, they didn't bring it in advance. And they were waiting around for hours and nothing happened. And after a while they gave up and just left the supermarket. Okay, so disruption of financial services in this way are quite bad. This was actually due to a software bug, uh, some uh, uh, I think something about the conversion rate from shekels to dollars uh, was somehow fed in as zero, um, and the system stopped. So we, we'd like to base Bitcoin on an infrastructure that basically stops these things from happening, right? We don't want wide disruptions of economic uh, payments. So let's start with the Eclipse attack. Uh, so this is actually work that I've done with uh, colleagues at uh, Boston University. 
Um, so the Eclipse attack basically talks about how Bitcoin nodes connect to the network, right? So some of it is going to be very specific to Bitcoin, but in some sense, this is how we know uh, to, to form connections in peer-to-peer -peer systems, right? So let's suppose we do have some network of nodes that are already connected on the internet, and somebody new just wants to join, right? So you boot up a new machine, uh, you've installed Bitcoin, you want to connect to the network. So what usually happens is you get an initial list of IP addresses either from some DNS server or from stuff that's uh, hard-coded into the software itself. Um, then what happens is you connect to some of these nodes and you ask them for additional addresses, basically IP addresses of their peers. Um, once these addresses are there, you can start to connect to them, right? And, and you actually store these in some in some list of known peers. Next time you boot up the same machine, it already has this list of, of nodes it can try to reconnect. Right? So that's basically how you acquire uh, addresses in a peer-to-peer -peer system. This isn't a very new thing. This is something that actually uh, happens in BitTorrent as well, things that pre uh, preceded uh, Bitcoin. So, uh, right? so one of the, the questions right, is once you get this list, how do you connect? And it's a, pretty sound piece of advice to choose your connections randomly uh, from this list and try to form them. Uh, and that builds very robust graphs. We know that the network is very good if everybody randomizes in some sense. Um, so Bitcoin was using uh, at least uh, initially these maybe eight outgoing connections from each machine. Of course, people don't uh, remain satisfied with that. Some of them change the parameters, especially if you're a minor or a large exchange, you're not going to stick to this infrastructure, but this is what was there in the code. Um, so now, uh, here's the idea of the attack, right? How can we disrupt this system? The idea is, of course, to use the Sybil attack that Vitalik already mentioned. Basically, we're going to, to boot up a lot of these machines. We're going to send a lot of lists of nodes, uh, and all of them are actually going to be IP, IP addresses controlled by the attacker. Right? And what happens is that this buffer right here is actually going to get um, slowly overrun with IP addresses of attackers. Uh, and the reason that IP addresses even get swapped out of here is because some of them become stale and old, right? Some of them belong to nodes that no longer are there. And when you hear about a new message, it's, it's, it makes a lot of sense to, to replace the old one for the new IP address. So, um, so this attack is basically a form of a Sybil attack. You pretend to be sending a lot of legitimate messages, but really you're just overflowing this buffer. Yeah, and what happens next is that when this machine uh, restarts, right, it only is connected to the attacker. It doesn't know any, anyone else, right, if you did your job well, or it, with high probability it connects just to the attacker. And the attacker is its only connection to the rest of the network. So you might be still hearing about blocks and you might be still hearing all the messages until the attacker one day decides to cut you off and basically filter all these messages and then you're hanging in air, right? So, in, so this, this attack is, is, uh, is very silent. You, you don't know that you're connected only to attacker nodes until the attacker decides to strike. So you could maybe think of doing this isolation slowly over months even uh, to many, many of the nodes in the network and then at one instant, just breaking all these connections, not allowing them to find each other. So the particulars of doing this in Bitcoin actually are a bit more complex. There are all these mechanisms that are there to stop you from, from breaking the, these connections. Um, so for example, the list of known peers in Bitcoin is actually not a single list. There are two of them. So the first list of, of IP addresses that we keep are the tr is, the, is called the tried table, is a list of IPs that we actually managed to connect to. Okay, so these are not just random IP addresses from the internet, they are, there is actually a Bitcoin client that we connected to ourselves that answered uh, behind this IP address. The other uh, list is just a list of untested addresses. So somebody told us IP so-and-so has a Bitcoin node, we, we haven't tried it ourselves, so we put it in the new table. Actually, each one of these tables is actually made up of, of buckets containing 64 IP addresses, each one. And there are all, the, all of these attempts uh, basically to, 
to make sure that if somebody tries to generate a lot of IP addresses and flood us with IP addresses, uh, he won't be easily able to do this. So maybe some of the IP addresses, uh, if they have the same prefix of the address, um, get actually routed into the same bucket. So the mechanism that does this is that we're looking at what's called the slash 16 address, basically the this, this first 16 bits of, of any IP address that were announced. Uh, and we look at the hash of that, and we, that gives us a random bucket to basically put that IP address into. So now if another IP address comes with the same prefix, it's probably an IP address that comes from the same uh, internet provider. It might even be the same computer that disconnected and reconnected to the network and got assigned a slightly different IP with the same prefix but, the, but a different suffix. So um, in that sense, it will get routed to the same bucket. It won't throw out any other IP addresses if it lands in different buckets. Right, so Bitcoin has all of these very complex rules. This is, even this is just a simplification, trying to avoid getting overrun and, and having all of its buffers controlled. Um, basically, though, right, the way to attack this, this scheme is right, using a two-phase approach, in some sense, to get uh, the, tried bucket, uh, uh, the tried table flooded. We, what we uh, try to do is to form a lot of incoming connections from many, many different IPs. So we just connect it to a node, then disconnect it. It, it automatically puts your IP in the tried table and evicts another one. So you form a lot of these connections. And the question is, how many IPs do you need, really, to connect from to, to, to be able to overrun this? The second attack, uh, the second stage, is actually to attack the new table, which is even easier. You just tell the node about a lot of IP addresses that you supposedly heard about that belong to Bitcoin nodes, but really are all fake. There's no Bitcoin node behind them. If it tries to connect to them, not, nobody will answer. Right? It, the, the, you could even take IP addresses from ranges where we know that have, you know that have not been assigned to anyone on the internet. And there's really no check, right? So this is e maybe even the easiest uh, to overrun. So, so the result is, right, so, uh, is that you don't need so many IP addresses to, to get control of, of the buffer at any node, or at least this is a graph that was true before this paper was published. Afterwards, some of the, uh, limits were raised in Bitcoin as a result, and a few of the uh, algorithms for eviction, for example, were, were corrected. Um, so this is maybe um, the number of addresses that you need, uh, right, that you needed to insert. Um, and, and this is the, right, uh, the number of addresses in the tried table, for example, that you managed to obtain, and this is the size of the tried table, right? So if I use maybe slightly more than 4,000 attacks, as 4,000 uh, right, uh, addresses, I could have, in Bitcoin's eviction, which is the green line here, I could have gotten control of most of the table, which means that if you randomly select eight connections, you're probably just connected to the attacker. Um, and so eventually we saw that Bitcoin's eviction policy was even worse, was doing worse than a random eviction policy, and this is the thing that was actually implemented in Bitcoin afterwards. Okay. So that was the eclipse attack. That, that was a mechanism within Bitcoin, and there are particularities to that mechanism, but I think other variants would also f fare per, uh, pretty badly. The next thing uh, that I want to talk about is network level attacks, and this is based on routing in the internet. So this is not, not, not Bitcoin's fault in some sense. Uh, the internet is very, uh, I guess, shoddy, and it's, you, can, you can very easily attack. So you may have heard about this incident. Uh, this, appeared, this is uh, the article in Wired uh, about a hacker that redirected traffic on the internet to steal bitcoins. So first of all, he only stole $83,000. This is small potatoes compared to, to some of the thefts we've seen. Right? But this was a very interesting attack. How do you redirect traffic and steal someone's bitcoins? What do you need to do? So, so here's what basically happened in the attack, right? So um, this is, uh, think of this as the, right, the structure of the, of the block, right? Uh, we have a header in every block. And the proof of work that we need to do, nobody's said it thus far, is uh, in Bitcoin at least, is to take a cryptographic hash of this header 
and make sure that this and check that if this number is very small. Right? This is this is what Bitcoin does. So, uh, so this proof of work is actually usually outsourced to others. Right? Uh, nodes don't do it themselves. Nodes that run in, in specifically in mining pools have a bunch of miners that know how to do cryptographic hashes very fast. They have specialized hardware. Um, so there's usually a mining pool server somewhere. And the mining pool server sends the block headers and a little bit more to, the, to these miners and gets as a result the nonce a specific value that he needs to place inside the header to get the hash of the block to be very small. Basically, the solution to the proof of work is given back by the miners. And usually the scheme was invented to kind of share the risk. Right? Bitcoin mining is, very, is a very risky business. You might not build a block for many, many months. And when you do, you get a very large prize. So in this way, when a large group of miners comes together, they can kind of split the profits and the mining pool operator gets some fees uh, for his services. Right? So basically what the attacker did in that case, um, right, he told the miners, uh, right, the miners connect to the pool via this, a protocol called Stratum. Okay, that's just the name of the protocol. Um, so they said, okay, the mining pool server had an IP address. The miner said, okay, I want to connect to that IP address to, to get work and give back my, my results. Um, the attacker somehow managed to divert traffic to his server, which was also using the Stratum protocol. And he was sending them work to do and getting the payments, but he wasn't delivering them their rewards and sharing them. He was basically keeping everything to himself. And he's done it uh, over, I think, a few days uh, without anyone noticing. I think he did 22 hijacks uh, and got a lot of these miners to work for him and collected money in several different forms of cryptocurrencies. So that was the attack. It was a very nice, uh, nice one, I think. Um, he didn't have to use any mining power of his own. He just diverted the ones, uh, the, the power uh, of some miners. So the, the reason that you can actually divert uh, traffic on the internet so easily has to do with how the border gateway protocol is built. So I don't know if you've heard of BGP. Who, who has heard of BGP? Okay, so there's a good crowd. Usually I get very few hands, right? This is something that runs the internet in some sense, but very few people have heard of it. So the BGP protocol basically says, how do you route between different autonomous systems? Autonomous systems are large, uh, right, are the sub-networks that make up the internet. Um, and so the way it works is basically if you have been assigned some, some IP range, if you're an autonomous system, maybe the Technion has some range of IP addresses, um, it will announce it to everyone who's connected to it in the network. Uh, this guy says, okay, I saw that 192.56 is through this connection, so I put it in my routing table, and every time a message comes to that IP address, I will send it there. But he also announces this, I have a route to 192.56, and he says this to all of his neighbors, and they again say, okay, now we have a route via AS2 and AS1, and so this routing message propagates through the network, and eventually everybody decides how they will route to this specific address. Okay, so this is done on an address-by-address -address basis separately. So the reason that it's so easy to attack the protocol is that just as this guy can announce, I have this IP address, a bad guy over here can also say the same thing. But this time he's not using the exact IP address, he's actually using something a little bit more specific. He's saying, I have 192.56.129, maybe. Okay, so both of these messages propagate to routers, and this guy says, okay, this guy has 192.56. everything, but if I want to do a routing to 192.56.129, I should go to AS5, right? So, um, unfortunately, the BGP, right, or IP routing rules basically usually send uh, traffic to the most specific address. So what this means is that the attacker actually gets all of the traffic to 192.56.129 to his machine. And there's no validation at all that this guy even does have the right to say that it's his IP address. Right, so he basically just steals the traffic, 
nothing stops it, right? It's, it comes as a shock to see hijacking uh, done so easily. Uh, the, by the way, the, the original hijack for, for the, that was taking money from Bitcoin mining pools was done by some Canadian ISP. Somebody used an, an account by, uh, uh, by some of their uh, staff, I suppose, and changed the routing uh, announcements. And they took from Canada basically all of the internet traffic aimed at the specific address that was uh, belonging to, to this server. Okay, so what else? So how common are these hijacks? Right, so one of the things that we've done is we've looked at six months of uh, traffic on the internet and BGP announcements. You can see that there are hundreds of thousands or tens of thousands of events uh, that, uh, that occur. These are the uh, purple bars. And the red line basically shows you how many prefixes are hijacked at the same time in one event. So most of these actually are not attacks. These are not somebody attacking the internet, but rather misconfiguration errors of routers, people who are just doing something by mistake. But you, you can just see the sheer amount of them. And actually, they affect a lot of Bitcoin nodes, some of them inadvertently, uh, because they happen to be in ISPs that get hijacked. So several hundreds of ISP nodes, uh, of, in, of Bitcoin nodes, I'm sorry, of Bitcoin nodes uh, get hijacked and their traffic is diverted. So this is a fairly common event and we haven't heard anything about it in the news. Right, so one more thing to know about hijacks is that they occur very fast when you hijack your own node, maybe within 20 or 30 seconds, you get all of the traffic from all of the internet to that node. Um, but they're very slow to repair. The reason that they're slow to repair is that you need human intervention to say, this guy across the internet who was announcing that he has my IP, he's actually a liar. And you have to call somebody up to tell him on the phone, please filter out these messages and restore uh, traffic to what it was. Right, so, um, and this usually takes on the order of hours. So, so maybe the, the most interesting attack to consider is what happens to the Bitcoin network if some uh, autonomous system basically said, I'm going to, to to, to do a massive hijack of traffic aimed uh, at different Bitcoin nodes, and uh, I've mapped them because we can crawl the Bitcoin network, we can hear about the IP addresses uh, through mechanisms that we've heard about. And basically, I'm going to keep the network separate. So one of the things we do in the paper, uh, we try to think about mining pools and how they route um, data Internally, mining pools today usually have several Bitcoin nodes connected to the network. They might have several gateways because they try to push out their blocks as fast as they can. And these might be encrypted and we might not be able to cut these connections. We don't necessarily know who's connected to who. Um, but we do know about the gateways. We do know these are just regular Bitcoin nodes and we can just hijack all traffic going to them. Okay, so how much do you need to hijack if you want to steal maybe 50% of the computational power and basically isolate it from the rest of the network? Right, that's the question that we wanted to ask. So, uh, so what we did is we looked at routing data on the internet, how stuff flows on the internet, how pools, uh, how many gateways pools have. We tried to do some exploring there. And we, we got very, very low numbers. If you wanted to isolate 47% of the mining power in Bitcoin, you had to hijack 39 prefixes uh, um, to get that partition, for example. That's very low. Nobody would even notice it, right? Almost nobody would notice it uh, until payments stop, stop flowing. So in that sense, we found that the Bitcoin network is very, very um, vulnerable. And part of the reason is not just because Bitcoin is very centralized in the hands of very few miners, but it's also that Bitcoin nodes are located in very few autonomous systems, right? So it's not spread out evenly throughout the internet. And if you look at other services, they're much better placed, right? Um, another thing that you could do to protect yourself from getting hijacked is uh, if the IP address that is advertised for you is very specific, as specific as it can be, because nobody can publish a more specific address. So slash 24 addresses are the most specific ones that get uh, relayed in Bitcoin, and only 7% of the nodes were actually in 
slash 24 prefixes. So every other node we could just hijack all of the traffic to. Slash 24 addresses, we can hijack maybe half of the traffic that goes to them. So, so that was unfortunate. Um, one more thing that we did in this study is we started to look at what happens if a major ISP decided to disrupt Bitcoin. So what would a major ISP do if disrupting Bitcoin, right? So let's, let's suppose I'm AT&T and I just got a court order from the US government and they told me, please shut down Bitcoin. So what do you do? So one of the interesting things is that you don't have to hijack any traffic. You, if you're AT&T or somebody very large, a lot of traffic goes through you anyway, right? You're uh, a major ISP in the network. Um, and then you can start thinking about how blocks move around in the system. And you look at the protocol itself. And surprisingly, the Bitcoin protocol is, uh, up until now, uh, not encrypted. This is something that's still planned out, but it's, maybe the lesson here is encrypt your, your traffic. So if you look at how the, the protocol moves, basically if I have a block, I, I announce it in an inventory message, I say what the block is, and the receiver would request it. Right? And then after I see the request, I send the block itself. So I send it back to the receiver. So this is what happens uh, usually when block are, blocks are announced. So Bitcoin nodes are, are connected to several uh, neighbors and they usually get these announcements from different directions. So to save on network bandwidth, basically, they just request the block from one neighbor and not from many others. And not only do they request it only from one guy, they wait 20 minutes to see if he responds before requesting again. Okay, so 20 minutes. So if you somehow get in the middle of that, that node is going to wait 20 minutes before it asks again and it's going to get delayed in getting the block by 20 minutes. Right? So traffic is not encrypted. It's very easy to get in the middle. Right? If we wait 20 minutes, uh, there's no block and the connection actually is dropped. We say, okay, this guy isn't answering. So here's, here are two attacks that you can do to get in the middle. One is, right, let's say I'm this internet provider of this guy, or I'm on the path, and I see his inventory request, right, and then, um, right, there's this get data going back, and then a block is supposed to go through. But I can just change some bits in the block. The block looks, to be, looks like it's invalid, doesn't pass the tests by the Bitcoin uh, protocol, right? It, proof of work doesn't work uh, as correctly. So now this guy waits for 20 minutes. He said, I didn't get the block that I asked for. He waits for 20 minutes until he asks again, but we lose the connection. Okay, so this is if you're listening to traffic from the sender to the receiver. Sometimes you might be listening to traffic in the other direction. In this case, you're even better off. Um, so he, this guy sends an inventory message. He says, basically, give me a block. I have a block, I'm sorry, I have a block. This guy requests the block. You can tweak this message to say something else. Let's request a different block. You give a different hash. Right, so this guy receives a request for a block that he doesn't have. So he doesn't respond. Right? And we wait for 19 minutes. And when a different re uh, uh, request comes in, maybe there's a new transaction that this guy is requesting, we take this value here and we put back the block that was originally requested and then the block trans is transferred. So we've just delayed the block transmission by 19 minutes and the connection wasn't dropped. So we can do it again for the next block and again and again. So this is a very effective attack and can delay block delivery. So maybe the, the best way to just stop all this monkeying around with the messages is to encrypt everything and then somebody in the middle wouldn't be able to, to do stuff with messages. Right, so that's maybe just a lesson. Okay, so uh, we've run this in simulations to see what happens to the network. I won't get into the details, I'm running out of time, but it basically starts to raise, uh, raise um, uh, the orphan rate. Uh, it's, you're very susceptible to zero confirmation attacks. A lot of things start to happen that are bad for you. So before I stop, I just wanna talk about mitigation techniques, right? So there are a lot of infrastructure projects. Uh, you may have heard about fiber. There was a Cornell project uh, uh, for, uh, for fast transmission of blocks. Uh, fiber is maybe the evolution of that plus the Bitcoin relay network that are meant to push blocks really fast to miners. They're also susceptible to attack if you can route 
uh, things on the internet that, you know, or hijack at will, then these things aren't going to help you. There's the satellite, right, that uh, Blockstream uh, put up in space that broadcast nodes. This is very nice, but the satellite is getting a feed from somewhere. There's somewhere, there's a gateway node that might be hijacked, right, and we might disrupt the satellite, right? I don't know how, how they structure their network. It might be interesting to, to, to think about. Uh, we've talked about other things like encrypting, uh, maybe using certificates to identify pools. So if you connect to a server, make sure that you know which server you're talking to. Your traffic may have been hijacked. And there's a lot more research needed on how to solve problems like the peer-to-peer -peer formation. All right, so in summary, maybe this is where I'll stop. Bitcoin is considered secure as long as nodes can communicate, right? Um, and communication is very easily disrupted. So there's lots more work to do to secure the network. Right? And I, I hope everybody gets to, to work on that. Thank you.